for the last year, I guess it's been, it really actually seems more like 25 years, but for the last year I have been working on a book called The War Racket, a treasury of the lies, promises, myths, and propaganda that have lured Americans into war after war after war. And for the last two or three weeks, I've been immersed in World War I. And of course, one of the purposes of this book, which will be out on the market, I hope, next spring, is to show that there's nothing new under the sun, that the things that we are being told today by our leaders are very similar to the things that were told to get us into World War One, World War Two, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, the war in the Gulf, the war on Iraq, the war on terrorism, and so on, that it just keeps coming back over and over. All the rosy promises of what's going to happen as a result of going to war, and those promises never come to fruition. All the lies that are told about the enemy, and all the lies that are told during the war about the progress of the war, and all the myths that are perpetu perpetuated afterward, as a way of getting us to get into the next war by telling us a very, very fictionalized account of how the last war was caused. Well, in noticing that these things just happen over and over again, I thought maybe tonight we'd start out by just giving a few examples of this. One of the things that recurs over and over again is that the peace candidate in elections always turns out to be the warmonger. In 1916, with the World War I having started in 1914, but America not yet in the war in November of 1916, the Republicans were clamoring for Wilson to take a tougher stand against the Germans and up to and possibly including going to war with Germany. Wilson was already of a mind to go to war. He wanted to get into the war, and he had his reasons, which we don't need to go into here, but he had already made up his mind to get into the war. But when he went to the Democratic Convention, where they renominated him for a second term, he found that one of the speakers had used the phrase that Wilson kept us out of war, and the convention went wild, screaming and cheering and yelling. And from there on through the rest of the convention, that became the slogan. He kept us out of war. So Wilson had to then pose as the peace candidate, and even said that I can guarantee you that if the Republicans get elected, we will be in the war in no time at all. Well, Wilson won the election, got, got a second term, and five months later he stood before Congress and asked for a declaration of war. It didn't take him any time at all. In 1940, Franklin Roosevelt ran on the platform, I hate war, I have seen war, and I detest war, and I will do everything in my power to keep America out of war. And uh, they had a, a slogan there, too, and... What it was escapes me at the moment, but it was very similar to he kept us out of war. And, in fact, at the very moment that he was saying how much he hated war and so on, he was already making secret agreements with the British and the Dutch to get us into the European war. And he was browbeating the Japanese, hoping that they would provoke something that would stir the anti-war American people who were fed up and disillusioned because of World War I to somehow inspire the American people to be willing to go to war again. Then in 1964, Lyndon Johnson, with the Vietnam War already in progress, but on a very low key, and Americans just there as advisors, kept saying over and over and over again that Barry Goldwater was a warmonger. And, of course, within a few months of Johnson winning re-election, the war in Vietnam escalated, and Americans were there as fighting soldiers, and the bombing of Hanoi and all of this went on. And then in the 2000 election, George W. Bush said that he did not believe in all this nation-building that President Clinton had been doing, trying to bring democracy to countries, trying to change their form of government. He said we needed a much more humble foreign policy, as he put it. And he accused Gore of following in Bush's footsteps. But, of course, here we have a man who, because no weapons of mass destruction were found in Iraq, and because no connection, no real evidence of any connection between Saddam Hussein and al-Qaeda has been found, Bush has been reduced to nation building, saying that the reason we were there in the first place was to liberate the Iraqi people and give them a democratic government. How many times in the last three months has he used the phrase mass graves as a way of reminding us how terrible that regime was and every American death and every dollar of those hundreds of billions that it looks like it's going to be before it's all over are justified by the fact that we got rid of an evil regime in the Middle East. So it goes on like that. And, of course, the promises. World War I was going to make the world safe for democracy. It was the war to end all wars. When it ended, one Prussian person said, well, now we've had the war to end all wars, and with the peace treaty they made, I think we now have the peace to end all peace. In the Second World War, it was the United Nations was going to put a stop to war. And, of course, what we wound up with was communism and the Cold War instead. We were going to liberate Europe, but half of Europe wound up in Soviet hands. In the Gulf War, it was the New World Order that was going to put a stop to war. And now we have the liberation of Iraq, which is going to serve as a model to create democracy throughout the Middle East. Wilson said Americans were privileged in the First World War to shed their blood 
to show the nations of the world how they shall walk in the paths of liberty. My God, where do they come up with these phrases? It is so ridiculous. And that's another thing, loose language. Wilson said, we fight for a universal dominion of a right by such a concert of free peoples as shall bring peace and safety to all nations and make the world at last free. What in the world was he smoking? Well, I guess marijuana was pretty much legal at the time, so he could smoke just about anything he wanted. And, of course, Roosevelt and, and uh, Lyndon Johnson and Harry Truman and all others made such similar ridiculous statements. And, of course, Bush says, we will rid the world of evildoers. Yeah, right. Then, of course, uh, we had the constant refrain that those who oppose the government in these endeavors are anti-American and pro-enemy. During the debate over the war declaration in 1917, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge said the only alternative to war was national degeneracy and cowardice. And regarding the senators who did speak out against the war, Senator Jim Reed of Missouri said, if that not be giving aid and comfort to the enemy, then I do not know what would bring comfort to the heart of an Austrian or German. Senator Kenyon of Iowa says, it is no time for criticism of the president of the cabinet of Congress. It is time for 100% Americanism. Now, how, how does that sound familiar? Why is it that that has a familiar ring to it? Oh, well. Senator Williams of Mississippi said, if it not be treason, meaning speaking out against the idea of going to war, if it not be treason, it grazes the edge of treason. And he accused Robert La Follette, the principal senator against the war, of being pro-German, pretty nearly pro-Goth, and pro-Vandal, as well as saying that La Follette's speech was anti-American president, anti-American Congress, and anti-American people. And, of course, we have the same thing going on today. In the last two years, anybody who spoke out against American foreign policy was pro-Usama bin Laden, pro-Hussein, why don't you go live in Iraq and all of that. One of the big things that happens in every war, of course, is that we are told we must give up some of our freedoms. For what purpose? To save freedom, of course. If we don't give up our liberties, how can we possibly have liberty? The Espionage Act was passed in 1917, almost with the start of the war, and it may surprise you to know that the Espionage Act was never used to convict one enemy spy or even one person who could be shown to be an enemy agent. It was used only in order to quash dissent. It was only used against people who spoke out against the government, and state and local governments did the same thing. An Ohio farmer was sentenced to 21 months for saying the Germans' crimes were no worse than those committed by American soldiers in the Philippine insurrection of 1900. Symphony orchestra conductors were arrested by local police if they refused to play the Star Spangled Banner at concerts. The editor of a black newspaper in San Antonio was sent to prison for two years under the Espionage Act for publishing an article praising a convicted killer for defending the honor of a black woman. My favorite example concerns a movie that was produced and premiered during the summer of 1917, and I'm going to tell you about that when we come back. This is Harry Brown. You can join me at 1-800-510-TALK. We will be back in just a couple of minutes. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown. So glad that you decided to join me this evening. You can get even more involved by calling 1-800-510-TALK or 1-800-510-8255. And I was talking before the break about the recurring themes that keep coming up war after war after war with special emphasis on World War I because that's what I've been so absorbed in the last few weeks. And also, I believe World War I was the turning point. And we can come back to that part of the matter a little later if uh, we have the time, but I was talking about all the civil liberties invasions that took place. A few more examples. A Lansing, uh, Michigan man received 20 years in jail for the heinous crime of saying in an angry moment that he hoped the government would go to hell. A fellow who predicted that the Kaiser would win the war received a six-month sentence. An Ohio resident was convicted for criticizing the president for appointing his son-in-law to too many government posts. A lot of the Espionage Act prosecutions had to do with the military draft. When the war was declared, the government called for a million men to enlist for the war effort, but after six weeks, only about 70,000 had volunteered. And the Akron Beacon Journal editorialized that the country had never been embarked upon a more unpopular war. So Congress solved the manpower shortage, needless to say, by conscription, authorizing a military draft. It was so unpopular that by the end of the war, over 300,000 men had been classified as draft debaters. Uh, the Socialist Party was about the only political party that actually opposed the draft, and it really prospered as a result. In New York, its uh, mayor candidate got about 22% of the vote when it was used to getting just 3 or 4%. Ten socialists were elected to the New York State Legislature on anti-draft platforms, and on and on. The government, on the other hand, figured that there can be no opposition to the draft, that to do so is to hinder the war effort, which is tantamount to espionage. So two men went to prison under the Espionage Act, just for handing out anti-draft literature. One elderly man was sent to prison for five years, merely for urging a young man not to enlist in the Army. And on June 15, 1918, Eugene B. Debs, who was the founder of the Socialist Party, gave a speech in Ohio in which he urged his audience to stand up against the patriots who, quote, 
apply the brand of treason, unquote, to anyone opposing the war. He was arrested for, quote, obstructing the recruiting or enlistment service. Debs was convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison. The trial judge called Debs a man who would, quote, strike the sword from the hand of this nation while she is engaged in defending herself against a foreign and brutal power. Well, of course, that foreign and brutal power, presumably Germany, had never attacked the United States, had never threatened to attack the United States, and had no intention of attacking the United States, which was quite similar to George Bush talking about defending America by attacking another country. And, of course, when, uh, of course, Deb's case went to the Supreme Court, you may have heard of the famous liberal justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who liberals never cease of telling us what a great champion of the Constitution he was. He wrote the majority opinion upholding the conviction, and later he complained that he'd received a lot of what he called stupid letters of protest. <laughs> and, and he said, get this, in these letters, there was a lot of jaw about free speech. <laughs> meaning these dumb people kept going on and on about freedom of speech. Another man printed leaflets that quoted the 13th Amendment, which is the one prohibiting involuntary servitude. And he said that the draft of uh, drafting of men for military service violated the amendment against involuntary servitude. Well, he got six months in jail. His case also went to the Supreme Court, and Justice Holmes wrote the unanimous opinion, saying that actions like this created, quote, a clear and present danger, unquote, to the United States. And so on and on and on it goes. Well, fortunately, in 1921, when Warren Harding took office, he pardoned almost all of these people, and he also pardoned Eugene Debs, whom Wilson refused to pardon when he had the chance a year earlier. And Harding said, I couldn't do anything else. These fellows didn't mean any harm. It was a cruel punishment. And, of course, uh, in the Second World War, the Japanese were interned, and it goes on and on, war after war. And one of the worst, of course, is that now we see our government paying no attention whatsoever to the Bill of Rights, but saying that it is, saying that it's doing everything in keeping with the Constitution. And we have President Bush saying that they can detain Jose Padilla without any trial, without any access to an attorney, because he's one of the bad guys. In other words, you don't have a right to a speedy trial, you don't have a right to counsel, you don't have anything else. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown. You're listening to the Radio America Network, and you can join the fun by calling 1-800-510-TALK or one 800 1-800-510-8255. Or you can email me, and that address is question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org, and Brown has an E on the end, and I'm not going to tell you that anymore. I mentioned earlier that my favorite example from World War One is about a movie. You may remember that Mel Gibson produced a movie called The Patriot in the year 2000, which was about the American Revolution, and it included many scenes of British atrocities that took place during the American Revolutionary War. Well, in 1917, a fellow named Robert Goldstein, Goldstein produced a movie called The Spirit of 76. The Spirit of 76. And it premiered in the summer of 1917, just a couple of months after America declared war on Germany. And that movie also, like The Patriot of Mel Gibson, showed atrocities committed by British troops. Well, Goldstein was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to 10 years in prison for doing as the judge put it, such terrible things as showing scenes that might make people, quote, question the good faith of our ally, Great Britain, unquote. So it was illegal not only to question the current World War I of the time, it was illegal not only to question the government, but if you displayed anything that cast any aspersions whatsoever on any of the allies, you could go to prison for 10 years. The case went to the Court of Appeals, which said that, quote, the truth or falsity of the incidents portrayed in the movie are not the essence of the inquiry. In other words, it doesn't matter whether all these things actually happened. The question is, does it cast aspersions on our great ally, Great Britain? Great Britain, incidentally, which had the world's biggest and widest far-reaching empire ever in the history of the world and was oppressing people in Ireland, oppressing people in India, but was our great ally and nothing bad was to ever be said about them. As the case went through the courts, it had a title, of course, as all cases do. And the title of this case was The United States versus the Spirit of 76. <laughs> I don't know how you could find a more apt title than The United States versus the Spirit of 76. I think you could apply that title to everything that's happened in this country over the last couple of years. One last thing about that particular era of civil liberties invasions, the Attorney General said that the country had never been so thoroughly policed. Well, goody, goody, goody. 
What other parallels were there? Well, we have the great charmer, as I think of it. Will, Woodrow Wilson was so in love with the sound of his own voice, and he was reputed to be a great orator, and he would move crowds. But getting people emotionally stirred up is not the same as persuading them to change their opinions, change their lifestyle, or to make any significant changes whatsoever. But he would go and be greeted by these crowds who would go wild over his oratory, and the newspapers would compliment him on these great speeches that he made. And when he went to Europe to negotiate the peace treaty with the British and French prime ministers, he first went to Rome and to London and to Paris and spoke to crowds who couldn't understand a word he said and just cheered him mightily because they were so happy and relieved that the United States had come into the war, finished off the Germans, and left them to go back to a peaceful world, they hope. But he, of course, took all of this as, my God, I can do anything. People listen to me. People are changed by me. I can do anything. And against everybody's advice, he himself went to Paris to negotiate the treaty when everybody told him he should never do that. And he went there and they picked his pockets clean. They took him to the cleaners. They worked him over something fierce. He's insisted that the treaty be tied to the League of Nations, that the League of Nations be part of the treaty. And the League of Nations was his big dream that was going to make the world safer democracy. And he figured if the two were tied together, then they would have to go along with the League in order to get the treaty and anything that they wanted in the treaty. Well, of course, it turned out just the opposite. He wound up going along with everything they wanted in the treaty in order to keep them in the League of Nations. Every time France said, well, we want the Pacific Islands, or we want Germany's African colonies, or we want Syria and Lebanon, Wilson would say, no, you can't do that. I have sworn to the world that all the peoples of the world will be able to determine their own fate. And the French prime minister would say, all right, well, I guess we won't join the League of Nations then. And so Wilson would eventually give in, and the French would get everything they wanted. Same thing happened with the English. Same thing happened with the Russians. Same thing happened with the Italians. The same thing happened even with the Japanese, who were given a province of China who wasn't even in the war. And Wilson just caved on everything. He came back with such a miserable treaty that nobody could possibly go along with it. And so the Senate rejected it if, if Wilson would not allow reservations, and he stood adamant that he wouldn't. And so the treaty was never ratified. And so the United States never joined his precious League of Nations. And the Allies went ahead and imposed all of these terrible uh, terms of the peace treaty on the Germans, which, of course, led to World War II. They were just feeding the Nazis. But this is not unusual. Franklin Roosevelt thought that he was such a charmer that he had the ability to sway anybody that he was going to bring Joseph Stalin into the community of nations, and that he and Stalin would work together to bring perpetual peace to the world. And, of course, Stalin took him for everything that he had. And Roosevelt left the world in a shambles in 1945 when he died. And it goes on and on. All of these presidents, John F. Kennedy, of course, thought that he was going to do all sorts of wonderful things to bring peace to the world. And he introduced concepts that, because of America's disillusionment with World War II at that time, were very alien to Americans. When he said, we will pay any price, we will shoulder any burden to bring peace to any country of the world, at the time, Americans did not take very well to that, although liberals who loved Kennedy, cheered and screamed and so forth. But the fact is that nobody really believed that we were going to go off running and fight wars all over the world. As it turned out, that's almost exactly what we did, but that wasn't what people wanted. And now we have George W. Bush, who thinks somehow that he's going to bring democracy to the Middle East. He thinks he liberated Afghanistan and Iraq. Well, I've got news for him. Both of those countries have been liberated over and over and over before, and somehow it didn't stick. And, he, of course, Bush has no idea of the background of all of these countries, of the problems that exist. One of the things they're insisting on in Iraq is that there will be no division of the country among the different ethnic groups, that Iraq will stay whole as one country, even though this is an artificial grouping of people, because Bush has no knowledge or no understanding of the history of this country. And so what they're going to have when the Americans leave are, of course, all kinds of civil wars. But these people, these presidents, they become so in love with the sound of their own voice that they think that they can do things that have never been done before. Let me give you one last parallel, and then we can move on to something cheerier. And that is the concept that force can solve anything. Over and over and over again, not just in America in the 20th and 21st century, but throughout history, people have been saying the only thing they understand is force, and we'll give it to them, and that will bring peace to the world that how many times have we heard in the last 20 or 30 years in the Reagan administration and even in the Clinton administration that weakness only invites war, that strength deters war? Well, the fact of the matter is that strength and force have never deterred war. Look at Israel and Palestine. I mean, both of these countries have been teaching each other a lesson for 50 years, and it has done nothing to bring peace to the, to the region. And, of course, today George Bush thinks that if he uses overwhelming force, that he is going to somehow demonstrate that it's not worth the trouble to these countries around the world to mess with the United States. But in fact, what he's bringing about is just the opposite. By going after Iraq, who did not have nuclear weapons, he has inspired North Korea to come out and say, we have nuclear weapons. And he's inspired Iran to step up their nuclear weapons program, because that's the only way they can hope to try to deter the United States from invading them as well. And of course, this last week, Hans Blix said that he is fully convinced now that the 
Iraqis destroyed any biological and chemical weapons that they had back in 1991, that they never had any nuclear weapons, but they kept hinting that they did because they thought this was possibly the only way they could deter the Americans. Well, this has all happened before. At the end of World War One, they imposed these terrible terms on Germany, assigning all the guilt for the war to Germany, when that, in fact, was not the case by a long shot. Germany was, a bad, was bad news, but so was France, so was Britain, so was Russia, so was Italy, and so was the United States. They were all at fault. Any one of those countries probably could have prevented the war from taking place, and none of them did. But it was not Germany's sole guilt. But as, by assigning the guilt to Germany, it justified the harshest reparations possible, the taking of territory from Germany, the taking of all their colonies, the destruction of the country, and then the humiliation of making them sign a peace treaty that said, we are responsible for the entire war. And of course, nothing could have done more to promote Nazism in Germany than making the Germans sign that humiliating peace treaty. Just as nothing has done more to promote recruitment in Al-Qaeda, most likely, than this war in Iraq. The New York Times at the end of World War I said the, punish, pardon me, the punishment Germany must endure for centuries will be one of the greatest deterrents to the war spirit. Then at the end of World War II, the Nuremberg trials were going to make war unthinkable. Who, what leader is going to make war knowing that he could be brought to trial afterward? And of course, unconditional surrender was the word during World War II, and the combination of unconditional surrender and war crimes trials means that whenever a war does start, and wars do start, regardless of what you do to try to stop them, that once the war starts, the last thing in the world any leader is going to do is to allow himself to be captured, allow the war to come to an end. He's going to do everything to prolong the war, try to stave off the possibility that he might be captured and have to stand trial and maybe be hung or put in prison for life. So it has done exactly the opposite. It has not deterred wars. It has made them worse. The A-bomb, the atomic bomb, that was going to deter wars, too. And we have had hundreds of wars, big and small, around the world since 1945. The idea that wars are invited by weakness, not strength, has been disproven over and over and over again throughout history, and especially during the last hundred years. But yet you continue to hear it, especially from conservatives. When we come back, I will mention a book that's pretty good on the subject that you might like to get because it is, for one thing, it's on the market right now, and it will tell you a great deal about World War I. And you can call me at 1-800-510-TALK, complain about what I've said, add to what I've said, or bring up an entirely new subject. I'm waiting to hear from you. This is Harry Brown. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Harry Brown here. Before we go to the phones, let me just mention that I've read a couple of dozen books on World War I, and one of the best, especially as an introduction to the subject, which covers everything from the beginning of America's entry right on through into the 1920s, is called The Illusion of War, and it was written by historian Thomas Fleming. And if you go to my website, harrybrown.org, and go to the radio page and then click on links to articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast, you'll find a link to the Amazon page where you can read more about the book The Illusion of War by Thomas Fleming. If you're going to read just one book on the war, then I would suggest that is the best one. It just came out, I believe, only uh, two or three months ago, and I don't know how well it's selling, but I certainly enjoyed it. If you're going to read more than one book, of course, there are a lot of other good books on the subject, and there was a lot of revisionism that came out during the 1920s and 30s, which helped to foster the disillusionment that Americans had with the involvement in World War I, and which made Americans so anti-war in the late 30s and early 40s that they really, really resisted the idea of getting involved in another European war. They were not pro-German. They were not anti-Semitic. They were anti-war, and that's why Roosevelt had to find some way of getting into war by what they called the back door. We're having a little trouble with the phones. We're going to talk with Michael in a royal grandee right now, but we had Dave from Virginia on the line, and both of them want to complain about what I've been saying. And, Dave, if you can hear me, I'm sorry that we lost the connection with you, but if you'll call back again, we'll be sure to get you on the, the air right after the news or as soon as after the news as we finish up with Michael. But let's go now to Michael in California. Good evening, Michael. Hey, Harry. How are you doing? All right. I'm sorry I had you confused with somebody else. Is it Mike or Michael? Either way. Okay. And where are you? Hello, Randy. Okay. California. We've hey. talked before, right? No, I've never called before. Okay. So I do have you confused with another Michael who's in Arroyo Ground, California. No, there's probably be more than one of us. Okay. Well, you'll have to look into that. He, yeah. With the name Michael, he may be a long-lost relative. Or then again, maybe he's a guardian angel. That's Who knows? True. What's up, Michael? Harry, I, I, I tuned in just a few minutes ago, and I heard you uh, with your monologue there. And I don't think I, I, I heard anything that I couldn't get into an argument with. <laughs> well, I mean, find a place to start. It's really hard to find a place to start, but let, let's pass over some of that stuff and, and tell me when we've ever in the history of mankind have had peace without victory. 
Well, that's what Woodrow Wilson promised when he took America into World War One. He said, this will be a peace without victory, because when you have victory, what it means is the other side is humiliated, it builds resentment, and it leads to the next war, and that's the one thing we're not going to have. But, of course, he abandoned all of that when he went to Paris for the peace conference and agreed to all kinds of punitive conditions being put on the Germans and forced them to take responsibility for the whole war. But look at the peace we've had since World War Two. We haven't had peace since well, World War II. Well, we have with, with Germany and Japan the access we have. All right, but we just turned to other countries. We overthrew the government of Iran. We've invaded Panama. We invaded Haiti. We invaded Grenada. We invaded Iraq. We invaded Afghanistan. We attacked Iraq when they were in Kuwait, and then we bombed Iraq for 10 years. And uh, we got involved in the Dominican Republic. We got involved in the Philippines. We have been in more scrapes than you can imagine. You can go to a Navy website, which I don't have the address to off the tip of my tongue, but they list there all of the... Uh, casualties that have taken place in various combats since World War II. And it's it's very interesting because even though it's not the purpose of the website, you suddenly are reminded of, or if you never heard of them before, you see all of these examples of where our government has been involved in a forcible confrontation with some foreign country. So we're the only superpower in the world. If we don't go and depose dictators, who will? Why do we have to depose dictators? All we're going to do is replace them with other dictators. Uh, Michael, stay on the line if you don't mind during the news. If you get off the line, we may never get you back. So if you don't mind staying on, we'll continue this after the news. And this is Harry Brown. After the news, we will be back for another almost full hour. And we will be glad to hear from you at 1-800-510-TALK. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown. I'm so glad you decided to stay with me. We still have almost an hour to go. And you can join us at 1-800-510-TALK or 1-800-510-8255. I got it right this time. And I mentioned that... The United States had been involved in numerous wars or confrontations since the end of World War II, and I did go to that Navy website. It's at the Navy Historical Center, and I have put a link to the particular web page on the radio links page in my website. So you go to harrybrown.org. You click on Get Details of the Radio Show, then click on Links to Websites and Articles Mentioned on the Show, and there you will see this uh, 234 instances of force used from 1798 to 1993. It is not up to date because it doesn't include the several encounters that have taken place since 1993. I don't know why they have not updated that. But just between the end of World War II and 1993, American forces were involved in 68 confrontations around the world of one kind or another, and I won't go into them because you can check them out for yourself. Michael, are you still with us? I'm with you, Harry. Okay, why don't you go on then from where you were? Well, I was basically making the statement that there's, there's never been a peace without a total victory, and uh, you even brought up the Israeli-Palestinian situation a few minutes ago. And, you know, the Israelis have been over six ways to Sunday trying to get, get some sort of peace with, with people who are avowed to destroy them, to remove them from the face of the earth, and the Israelis keep trying. Now, if the Israelis just decided to, to declare war on the Palestinians and their pseudo-nation and just knock the hell out of them, they probably could have a lasting peace over there, but they're, they're going about it all wrong by trying to be a peacemaker, much as, as what you espouse. You know, we, we've gone to 68 places in the last 50-whatever uh, years it is, and uh, maybe we should have been, maybe we shouldn't have been, but we went there and we did what we had to do. We are the alone superpower in the world. Well, does that make us the obvious and uh, automatic judge of what's right or wrong, of what's moral and what's immoral, and who's right and who's wrong? No, but if we don't put a foot down somewhere along the line, it's going to happen just like it happened in Germany in the 30s. And uh, what do you mean? That's That somebody's going to get strong enough to rule the world? Well, or try. Well, hasn't yep. that already happened? Well, it's liable to happen again. Okay, you know, no, no, I mean, hasn't that happened contemporaneously? Don't we now have one country that is ruling the world and that anybody who brooks any confrontation with the United States who says that we don't want to do what you want us to do is now subject to force and violence? That doesn't really hold water, Harry. If we were an imperialist nation, as you're suggesting, why did we give uh, Kuwait back to Kuwait? Well, what Why did we just take the oil and say, you guys forget it, get the hell out of our way? It doesn't really matter whether there was any obvious pecuniary gain involved. The fact is that we are telling other, or our government is telling other countries how they must live, what kind of government they have, and if they don't have the right kind of government, then our forces go in there at loss of American life and great loss of civilian and military life on the other side, and they throw their weight around, and what do you know? It recruits more terrorists in the process, and more and more people come to hate the United States and think that we are nothing but a big bully. You know, the French may have had good reason to oppose the United States and the United Nations. They aren't just effete, immoral people. They may have truly believed that it was wrong to attack Iraq when there was absolutely no evidence that Iraq was a threat to anybody. Well, now, Iraq being a Muslim nation and Islam, and what I read about Islam is not really what I would call a friendly religion. Well, neither is Christianity, if you read a lot of the Old Testament of the Bible. Well, yeah, you keep reaching back. You, you, you reach back to the Old Testament just now. You reach back to World War I. You well, reach... you're reaching back to the Koran. 
what it says in the Quran. But I understand what you're saying. And Ann Coulter, the, the conservative attack dog, says we should go into the Middle East, conquer them all, and Christianize every last one of them. Well, we probably bring a lot more peace than we have today. It didn't in the Philippines. William McKinley said he was going to Christianize those heathens in the Philippines, and he didn't even realize, he didn't even realize that over half of them were Roman Catholics already. That's what presidents do. They make these statements not knowing anything. George Bush says, you're either with us or against us. Now, what would you think if the emperor of China, whoever is in charge of China now, told the people in the United States as well as the people, the rest of the people in the world, that if you don't do what the Chinese want, we're going to come in there and blow you to smithereens the way people have been blown to smithereens in Afghanistan, Iraq, Haiti, uh, Panama, and all these other countries that the U.S. has moved into. How do you think Americans would react to statements like that? Well, Americans like me, who I feel is a, a red-blooded American male who's fought for his country, would probably uh, echo our president's words and bring it on. I see, and it wouldn't matter how many innocent people get killed in the process. Well, there's always it, it'd be, be a chance to show off how macho you are. There's always going to no. If, if the Japanese prime minister or president, whatever he is, says you're going to you're going to go with us or we're going to destroy you, and I say bring it on. I'm not I'm not showing I'm macho. I'm showing that I'm not going to knuckle under to anybody that's going to come after me. Well, then what's wrong with somebody in the rest of the world saying I'm not going to knuckle under to George W. Bush? Well, that that's their prerogative. Right. They can they can either knuckle under or die. That's their choice. That's right. And that's the, that's what a free country does. It lets people choose between obeying or dying, and that's the definition of freedom. Yeah, that's that's what our founding fathers fought for, to create a nation that was separate from the rest of the world, that was free, that valued the liberty of the individual far above the state, and did not talk about national interest, did not talk about superpowers, did not talk about being the policeman of the world, but talked about a haven someplace in the world where people could come from anywhere and not have somebody ask for their papers, not have a number attached to them, not have to pay an income tax, not have to do any of the things that have been so oppressive and so common in all the other countries or most all of the other countries of the world and this is what it has come to now is that we are just a stupid superpower like Germany thought it was like France once thought it was like Britain thought it was like Russia thought it was we're just no better than any of those well I don't accept that well, I believe America was unique and I want America back okay. and I think that people who believe that America because it's a superpower of the world ought to be able to tell everybody what to do are not only not pro-American they're not patriotic they are anti-American anti-everything that this country used to stand for now, hasn't the American way worked in, in Germany and Japan after World War II it isn't the American way we went over there and imposed socialism on Germany and on Japan are they socialist nations today they certainly are in a, in a sense, Jap Japan was more fascist than socialist in that they have allowed a greater degree of private enterprise but controlled completely by the government, with the government deciding what products would be allowed to be produced, what production quotas would be, and so forth. And, of course, Germany, both West and East Germany, were very socialist countries, even more so than the United States has become over the last hundred years. Well, I agree with you that the, the tend is toward socialism, and the Democrats uh, are the. And that's what our country, and that's what our diplomats and our military impose upon other countries. They don't go in there and establish a free enterprise system, whatever Rumsfeld or Bush says. They go in there and establish universal health care. They establish social security. They establish all the things that have so deteriorated economic life in America. And that is not spreading freedom around the world. That's spreading socialism and oppression around the world. And that's what our government is guilty of. And I'm sorry that I've dominated this dialogue, Michael. I, I really shouldn't because uh, I invited you to call and I appreciate your comments and I understand why you feel as you do but I strongly suggest that you start studying history a little especially the history of the last 50 years and you may come to the conclusion that whatever George Bush says that's not the way it has been and that's not what America has been standing for for 50 years it has been rejecting every single one of the American ideals that were embodied in the Statue of Liberty and which attracted people from all over the world and it's got to stop before America is destroyed like the Roman Empire was destroyed like Napoleon was destroyed like Hitler was destroyed like like the uh, communists were destroyed in the Soviet Union we are no better than they are. We have no special license on life that permits us to do what they did and get away with it. They had to pay the consequences, only it wasn't just the leaders that paid the consequences. It was every innocent person in that country that suffered for it, and that's what's due to happen to the United States unless this thing turns around. Well, democracy's never been called a perfect system, but I would say the people in Germany and Japan are, are better off today than they were under Tito and, and Adolf Hitler, and you might as well throw Italy in there, too, with Mussolini. Well, all you have to do is to look at over and over in the countries that America has interfered with in the last 50 years, and you would have a great deal of trouble finding one that is better off for the intervention, whether it's Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Panama, Iraq, Afghanistan, Grenada, any of these countries. We do it and then turn our attention somewhere else, and nobody ever goes uh, around there to see what the mess is that was left for the people who now have to clean it up and have to live with some oppressive dictator that our country installed because he was more anti-communist than the Democratic leader who had been there before. Thanks for calling, Michael. Okay, Feel free to call anytime you want, and we will go back to the phones as soon as we come back. This is Harry Brown. Welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and either Michael said something very provocative or I did because the phones are just really jumping right now, and since we only have about 35 minutes or so left, I don't advise you to call now, but anybody who is 
on the line with us now waiting. I hope you'll be patient, and we will try to get to every caller that's on the line now. Well, let's go to Bud in Yonkers, then. Bud in Yonkers, are you with us? Yes, I am, Harry. Uh, uh, thank you for waiting so long. Sure, my pleasure. Uh, a bit of information that I picked up reading in one of the uh, Freedom Mag- magazine, they call it. Uh, this former U.S. Air Force Captain Joyce Riley at a uh, seminar and uh, speaking with Garth Nicholson and his wife, who have conducted research into the Gulf War illnesses, she claimed that in the next 10 years to 22 years, there are going to be 80, this from the Persian Gulf War, will rise to 80 to 100,000 deaths. And the reason for that is because, according to Garth Nicholson, Ph.D., and his wife, Nancy Nicholson, Ph.D., they initially conducted research into the Gulf War illness at M.D. Anderson Cancer Center at the University of Texas in Houston. There, the Nicholson's isolated an apparent cause of sick veteran symptoms in a possible component of a Saddam biological cocktail. They call this microorganism known as mycoplasma, fermentious ecognish, which can cause protracted illness and lingering death. Now, I, I wanted to get that out because there's, there's many, many more guys that are going to be dying from the chemicals that they've taken home and their families die with them because their families contract the illness from, from the husbands. If it's a wife, she gets it from her, and the kids get it. And, and freedommag.com is the website. You can go on and get that. But anyway, one of the correlations that I've noticed in reading over the last uh, year and a half is that the, uh, the actual ethnic cleansing that started in Bosnia and Kosovo by uh, we have three chaps that really got into this. And you're familiar with Jovan Raskovic and Radovan Karadzic? I don't know because okay. those names okay. are Jovan Raskovic, Serbian names, it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, he was the orchestrator of the Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and would be between the courts of Bosnians and other Balkan, uh, ethnicities in the minds of the, you know, in the Serbs. In January 1992, shortly before hostilities spilled from Croatia into Bosnia and Herzegovina, Raskovic uttered a chilling confession on Belgrade's Utel television. By the way, he's a psychiatrist. I feel responsible because I made the preparations for this war. If I hadn't created this emotional strain in the Serbian people, nothing would have happened. My party and I lit the fuse of the Serbian nationalism, not only in Croatia, but everywhere else in Bosnia and Herzegovina. That's a funny thing now. Here's a man who basically a psychiatrist, uh, Raskovic, who basically was the mentor of Radovan Karadzic, who was in charge of the Balkans, and believe it or not, to this day, he was the one that was the psychiatrist for Slobodan Milosevic. By the way, he's in the, in the Netherlands. He's at the, at the Hague. And he's uh, on Prozac. Trial, yes. right? And he's on Prozac. He's a, he was a mental patient. I mean, that's... Milosevic was a mental patient? Oh, yes, he is. Well, he's standing trial right now. Yeah, but he... making his own defense. I think we got the point. And I'll just add to what you said, that well, the Veterans Administration says that there are 161,000 veterans of the Gulf War now who are on disability or are receiving disability payments from the United States government. So whether or not Gulf War syndrome is actual, and conservatives and liberals fight over this, but the fact is that in one way or another, the Veterans Administration is satisfied that 161,000 veterans who were in the Gulf War are entitled to some form of disability. Bud, thank you for calling. I appreciate it. And right now, let's go quickly to Rob in Pittsburgh, who's also been waiting a long time. Rob, are you with us? Yeah, hi, Harry Brown. I think you're making a lot of good points, but I don't know if I can agree with what I think you're suggesting I think it sounds like you were suggesting that uh, these trials, war crimes trials that happen after these wars are, are a bad idea. I don't think I can agree with you on that. Well, would you agree that if you're going to have war crimes trials, then all war crimes ought to be subject, including those of people who were on the side of the victors? Yeah, I would agree with you on that. Yes, uh, in, in which case, there would have been a lot of Americans and British on trial at the end of the Second World War for bombing innocent civilians in Dresden and Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and there would have been a lot of American commanders on trial after the Kosovo War for bombing innocent Serbs and Kosovars during that war, but that's never going to happen. All you're going to have is victor's justice, that whoever wins the war gets to call all the rules, and so you might hope that those trials would be fair, but they're not. They never are. They never have been whenever they've been done throughout history. They are rife, not just with the fact that the victors aren't on trial, but the fact that even the guilty people on the other side who are on trial have their crimes either exaggerated or the real atrocities are ignored and others are brought up, which may or may not be true. I'm monopolizing again, so stay with us, Rob, and I'll give you a chance to reply to that when we come back, which will be in just a couple of minutes. Stay tuned, everybody. Okay, Rob, I grabbed the microphone away from you. You go ahead and speak now, and like Bill O'Reilly, I'll give you the last word and then interrupt you after the first word. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, I won't do okay. that. I'll make it quick. Uh, you no, go I'm ahead, Rob. Waiting, but, uh, no, I mean, no, I agreed with what you said then. I mean, I just think that if, if people, you know, innocent people's human rights are violated, I think that the guilty have to be held accountable. And I, would, I don't have any perfect solution to offer. It would be nice if all the oppressors on both sides could somehow be held accountable. But you're certainly right that, you know, it's the victors that get to decide what's right and what's wrong. Yes, and it's just one more government program. <laughs> and it's not going to work any better than Medicare or the war on drugs or anything else. And that's the problem. It's... It seems that government is the only solution. So if there's a problem, then it's got to be government. And sometimes we don't think of it as government. No, we're just saying we're going to impose justice on the people who started this awful thing, whatever it was. But what we're talking about is giving people like Bill Clinton, George Bush, Al Gore, Teddy Kennedy, and Bill <coughs> Clinton the ability to go over and do what we would wish would be done. And you know what happens? They do what they wish would be done, not what we wish would be done. And yeah, that's a good point. All right, uh, Rob, thanks so much for Thank calling. You. I appreciate it. Right. Let's go now to Bob in St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg, Florida. I presume that is Bob, right? 
Yes, hi, Aaron. How are you doing? Just fine. Thanks for calling. I have to uh, agree with you about, uh, well, basically getting back to the subject, that uh, the world was lied to in the past, and it is being lied to today by uh, George Bush and his uh, poodle, uh, Tony Blair, regarding this uh, this war. Uh, basically, um, uh, nothing, uh, we haven't really gotten much out of it, and the, the story keeps changing. The reason, the selling point keeps changing. First it was one thing, then it turns into the next thing, and then finally we just say, okay, well, it was a bad regime. That's true, it was a bad regime. But uh, at the same time, uh, the a public needs to know, I'm pretty sure the public is not stupid, basically Bush and his cronies are all getting uh, their pockets set with all the contracts that, are, that they're getting there, and also the contract that they got in Afghanistan for the oil pipeline. And at the same time, they, they've just installed the new, t- new tyrants with different names in both of those countries. Sure. In fact, ones in Afghanistan, some of them are known to be pedophiles. And there's a website uh, from the wilderness.org that has some info on that. Another thing I want to know about is the Patriot Act and um, uh, how it's just uh, completely going against the Bill of Rights. And um, I saw another site about that, BORDC.org, that's trying to fight that back. I'm wondering how can Americans fight back this kind of fascism? I don't have an easy solution to it, obviously. I think that it's important for each of us to stand up in whatever way he feels comfortable doing. I feel comfortable getting on the radio and ranting and raving and writing wild, (laughs) fire-breathing articles. But that may not be the same for you. You start talking like I talk at your place of business, and you may be out of a job tomorrow. And there is no obligation on you. You have no moral responsibility to try to stand up for the world, your country, or anything else. You have a life to lead and a family to support, and you should do what is comfortable. But if you are comfortable doing something about this and standing up, it's a start. We are already seeing Bush's approval rating just slipping and slipping and slipping. And even today, a 70% of the American people, according to the polls, think that Iraq was responsible for 9-11, they still are becoming more and more disenchanted with, number one, George Bush as president, number two, the idea that we should have gone to war with Iraq, number three, that anything good is going to come out of it, number four, that Iraq is going to be a better place as a result of it. And that's very significant. And this is the pattern that happens. If only these things could happen before the war rather than after, but they generally happen after the war. And incidentally, I thank you for mentioning one other common theme that happens throughout the war, and that is the changing of the reasons for doing it. It always starts out with one reason and shifts to another and then another and another. And that was true in, in both world wars. It was true in the Gulf War. It was true in the war in Korea as well and certainly true in the war in Vietnam. So I appreciate you bringing that up. But I don't have any easy solution for you as to how we're going to turn this thing around. But a little patience while a little bit of action uh, can go a long way because I think that things are going to continue this way. And I one of the great things that's happened is that I just assumed that as soon as this Iraq thing was settled, they were going to turn their attention to somebody else, and we were going to be faced with one war after another up through the 2004 election, and then suddenly after Bush is reelected, it wouldn't seem so important to be going to war anymore. I think Bush has been deterred. I think that what has happened here has made it very, very unlikely that he's going to want to invade Iran or Syria or Lebanon or any of these other countries. So I'm already more optimistic about things than I was six months or a year ago. Bob, thanks so much for calling. Let's go to New Orleans now and talk with Mark. Good evening, Mark. Yes, good evening, uh, Harry. Thanks so much for calling. What's on your mind? Yes, I, I wanted to uh, first uh, you know, talk about your first caller, uh, Mike. Uh, mm-hmm. He said that, uh, yes, he agrees with the policy of... Uh, making everybody in the world knuckle under, obey our orders, prostrate before the president of the United States, or die. And that's not imperialism? Right. Not and, imperialism? and, of course, of course, what he's done is to distinguish between our going in and making Kuwait or Iraq or Afghanistan a colony, the way the British did when they took over all these places around the world, and the way other countries' empires have done in the past. But pecuniary interest is not necessarily the indication of whether it's an empire. Control is just as much a part of empire as drawing resources out of the country is. Well, for your information, uh, I have already seen on TV, I couldn't believe it if I had not seen it, but some so-called conservatives have come out publicly and called what Bush is doing enlightened imperialism. Enlightened imperialism. Oh, it's a good beautiful. brand of imperialism, but at least, you know, they have the guts and the gumption to come out and say it instead of, uh, you know, uh, standing for imperialism and deny that, that, that it even exists. And I want to uh, definitely agree with what you said about uh, war crimes, uh, Lately, we have seen the spectacle of uh, the, this world court, which is nothing but a kangaroo court. Uh, initially, they were showing the uh, trial on the C-SPAN of uh, Slobodan Milosevic, who was kidnapped and brought to, uh, you know, to Holland. And he was doing exceedingly well for himself, uh, uh, even though the judges would shut him up, didn't allow him any latitude to question witness or, or make any statements in his defense, uh, for, for, for the most part. But notwithstanding all of that, he was showing... Uh, that there's, there's, there's really no case against them. Uh, you know, all of this was uh, made up, just like in the news mentioned about Severinitsa, and, you know, even a previous caller mentioned about some psychiatrist that admitted that uh, it was his fault and all of that. Uh, you know, there have been, uh, the, the administration, this administration, as well as previous administrations, have been in, involved in a conspiracy along with the press to actually make up quotes by people that either exist or even do not exist. I do not believe 
that this Serbian psychiatrist exists and made such a ridiculous statement as that. I really don't believe it, and I don't think anybody can even prove it. Well, it wouldn't be the first time something like that has happened. And, but, and of course, since the war in Kosovo ended, the Albanians there have cleansed the province of all Serbians. Virtually all Serbians have been kicked out of the province. So the whole war was fought to stop ethnic cleansing, and the result was ethnic cleansing, just like World War II was fought partly to liberate Europe, and half of Europe wound up in the Soviet orbit when it was over with, and you could just go on and on. Sure. And I want to remind you of what I told you about a month ago that I read in USA Today at the time, that uh, uh, you may remember that in 1999, uh, you know, uh, every congressman and every idiot that uh, had a microphone would uh, make, you know, like extraordinary claims of uh, half a million Albanians, three-quarter of a million oh, yeah. Albanians killed. And the mass, the mass they raid. said that the worst case of a massacre was 14 people. They sent the FBI, they sent forensic people from the United States trying to find something, and the worst case have been 14 people, and we don't even know who they are. They might, they're probably even Serbs killed by the Albanians. We are dominated by a, a world of, of lies. Yes. And if, if people don't realize that, I think there's no hope for them. You know, they're not only imperialist, but irrational as well. Well, I understand what you're saying, and, and the press goes along with it because so much of what we read in the newspapers is really government handouts. They're getting their information from the Department of Defense, the Department of State, and so forth. That's a lot easier than going over there and inquiring of all those people and finding out what's going on. Mark, thanks so much sure, for calling. Thank you very much. Always glad to hear from you. And let's go now quickly to Tennessee. Dorian, are you with us tonight? I'm here, Harry. How are you? Just fine. Uh, we're, I guess we're running late, and I want to make some comments, but can I uh, read something to you, which is bad radio, but I hope you enjoy it? <laughs> I hope it's you can not laugh too long. Out of it. Is that all right? All right. I hope it's not too long. No, well, I'll, I'll read it. It's, uh, I won't say anything else. It's August. 15, 1789, it's a debate on the, uh, in the House of Representatives. And James Madison has just proposed a compromise in the First Amendment that the government shall make no national religion. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's his statement. Eldridge Gary answers. Bear with me. I think you'll enjoy it. Mr. Gary did not like the term national proposed by the gentleman from Virginia, and he hoped it would not be adopted by the House. It brought to his mind some observations that had taken place in the conventions at the time they were considering the present Constitution. It had been insisted upon by those who were called anti-federalists, that this form of government consolidated the Union. The Honorable Gentleman's motion shows that he considers it in the same light. Those who were called anti-federalists at that time complained that they had injustice done them by the title because they were in favor of a federal government and the others were in favor of a national one. The federalists were for ratifying the Constitution as it stood and the others not until amendments were made. Their names then ought not to have been distinguished by federalists and anti-federalists but rats and anti-rats. <laughs> oh, gosh. Who wrote that? <laughs> well, that's Elbridge Gary. Finally, oh, oh, he, uh, that's, on James Madison. Those are his own words in 1789? Yeah, it's in the House record. Listen, I, I come across stuff as I do this reading. Uh, just to elucidate the point that even in those, at least they were honest in those days. <laughs> but we have so whitewashed history and wars and whatever. Uh, you know, and, and Gary was calling Madison a friggin' hypocrite and liar. Well, it is interesting that with all of the trend to big government and so forth and the invective that we see from time to time, debates in Congress have actually become far more civilized than they were even at the time of the First World War, let alone in the 19th century when all kinds of accusations were made by congressmen against each other. And they even had fistfights from time to time. We even had a duel, didn't we? Yes. Yes, we and, had a uh, vice president and a secretary of the Treasury. So not everything has gone downhill. Some things have been elevated somewhat. But, of course, maybe along with that has become this greater bipartisanship, which is not a good thing. No, not at all. Um, there's another phrase, I'll save it for another show that you'll really get a kick out of, but, uh, you know, it's what you're saying. We, we, we don't admit the, the enmity, and poor guys get locked up in prison for criticizing the government. And here's a vice president of the United States and governor of Massachusetts at the time, though, of course, a member of the House calling a future president of the United States a rat. Yes. Lord Congress. Right. Anyway, I thought I'd add a little fun to this. Uh, and by the way, yes. you've got to watch out for guys like Mike. He just listens to too much Neil Bortz. <laughs> All Have right. Thanks, thanks, thanks for calling, Dorian. And we will be back in just a couple of minutes to wrap this up. Well, we've had us a lively show this evening, at least the last hour or so has been lively. Before that, it seemed like somebody was monopolizing the conversation. I've had several emails that I haven't had time to get to with all these calls for the last hour, but a couple of them can give us a point of departure to wind this up. Dave in Minneapolis says, it's not Dave who kept getting cut off on his cell phone, but Dave in Minneapolis says, one of your callers was taking the position that as the world's only superpower, it's our job to get rid of dictators in other countries. But that implies faith that we will do a good job when we go after these bad guys. In both Chile and Guatemala, we toppled tyrannical governments and replaced them with governments that were worse than the original regimes. As you keep saying every week, big government programs either don't work as they were intended or else they create unintended consequences that make the original problem worse than it was before. The federal government does a lousy job at Medicare, Social Security, the war on poverty, the war on drugs, and, yes, on spreading freedom. And that's a good point, and your examples of Chile and Guatemala, of course, are only two out of many, many, where we replaced a 
perhaps mediocre or poor regime in Iran with the Shah of Iran, who was a terribly oppressive regime and which led, because of American support for the Shah, to the taking of the American hostages at the American embassy in Iran in 1979. And you could go on with Cuba, Nicaragua, a whole lot of places, the Dominican Republic, especially throughout the Western Hemisphere, where our government has replaced what it thought were bad governments with governments that turned out to be a lot worse. And let me reiterate what Dave said, that when you think that because we're the superpower, we need to do this and do that. I just want to reemphasize, recognize whom you're talking about. You're talking about the same government that has fouled up everything, virtually everything that it has touched in this country. What makes you think it will be any more successful, whether it is in conducting war crimes trials or bringing peace to the Middle East or anything else? Now, the other email was from George, somewhere out there in cyberspace, who says, this is the first time I have listened to your talk show, and all I heard from you was how all the presidents of this country love to hear themselves talk. It must be great to be the only one that knows what our forefathers wanted for this country, like yourself. And I know you must have heard this before. Why don't you leave this country and go to a better one that you like? That's what I did. That's why I am an American citizen now. Well, George, I understand, and I don't know where you came from. And you may feel that life is better in the United States than it was where you were. And that may very, very well be true. That doesn't change the fact, though, that life in these United States are not what it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago. It is not even what it was 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. As recently as 1980, the national debt of the United States was only a trillion and a half, and now it's $7 trillion. As recently as 20 years ago, the federal budget was less than a trillion dollars, and now it's over $2 trillion. A lot of things have changed, and things have gradually gotten worse here. And I have a friend who lived in one of the Iron Curtain countries, and just to protect his anonymity, because I haven't asked him if I can talk about him on the air, he lived in an Iron Curtain country, and he and his brother swam across the Danube River in order to get to freedom from the Iron Curtain. They got into Germany. His brother left Germany and came to the United States and wrote to my friend and said, boy, you've got to come to America. It's so much better. And this was around 1980 or so. I'm not really sure when, but in that area. And so my friend came to the United States. He was able to get a job and do some training to learn a field, which he got into, eventually built his own business, and now has several million dollars. And he loved this country when he came here. Now he's going to leave it. He is thinking of moving to another country. He's already bought a residence there because he cannot stand what has happened to this country in just the 20 years he's been here. We need to change that. We need to get back to America, and we don't do it by running to another country. Thank you for being with me tonight. This is Harry Brown. See you next week.